You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Chagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I am joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Vancouver Point Grey Campus. And um, my co-host, Shagan, can't be here today, but we have a fabulous guest um, also from UBC, a uh, friend and colleague, Lara Boyd. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for inviting me to come and talk with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So um, I have a, a kind of a different background. So um, I initially started off my career as a physical therapist, and I started off treating people with stroke. Um, and after a few years of that, I found that I was incredibly frustrated because to my view, my patients just weren't recovering enough. We weren't seeing enough change. And I really felt like a car mechanic who doesn't know how an engine works and people bring you their car and they say, okay, fix my engine. And I would have a nice look in there and think, oh, that's cool. I have no idea what to do now. So I found after that for a few years, I really decided I needed to go back. So I went back to school to get my doctoral degree and I wound up with a doctorate actually in kinesiology because at that time, neuroscience was not a field you could get a degree in yet. It has become since that time. Um, so I put the two together. I'm very interested in understanding how people change their brain to learn and also to recover after it's damaged. And I use advanced imaging techniques to ask those questions such as the MRI I'm here at UBC, and um, I guess the rest is history. I've been doing that work now for over 20 years. Well, the rest is history is, is a good way of putting it. You are a preeminent scholar in this field. You are, the, I'd say, the, one of the household names that comes to mind when we talk about neuroplasticity and the effect of um, physical exercise on the brain and how the brain can recover after injury. Um, how did you get interested? Well, first of all, what is neuroplasticity and how did you get interested in it? Yeah. So if you believe it or not, the field is having an argument right now about what neuroplasticity is. So it's, it's really interesting for me to be following this literature, but generally neuroplasticity would be defined as the, the brain changing um, to adapt to new information. And so the brain can typically change in, in three ways. And, and usually these changes happen together. So it, we can change the, the amount of chemicals, the amount of neurotransmitter available. That happens when we're learning. We can change the structure of the brain, both the volume, so areas can get bigger as you practice things. We also now know that certain brain structures can get larger or smaller to accommodate learning. And then lastly, the, the brain function changes. So patterns of functional activity change. And when those things happen, when the brain changes any one of those systems or all three um, to support a different behavior, we call it neuroplasticity. That's so cool. Okay, so the brain can change itself, which when I was a student, we were told like, that's it, like whatever you got, that's what you're stuck with. And in fact, I remember these quite sort of, um, well, wagging finger speeches of if you get drunk on a Saturday night, you're losing brain, you'll never get it back. Like your brain, it's what you got and nothing is ever going to change. And I remember that emergence of um, talk about neurogenesis happening. And that was, it blew everybody's mind, right? Like that this wasn't such a static system. It, it's really true. And so to tell you, to like give you a sense of how quickly the field changed, um, when I finished my master's, my clinical master's degree, we were taught the same. The brain never changed. In fact, we kind of had this idea that, you know, after about puberty, it was really in brain terms, all downhill. You were doing nothing but losing neurons and things getting worse. Um, and then I, I went back to start my PhD just three years later. 
And that first year that I was a doctoral student, um, a seminal paper came out uh, from Randy Nudo, who was studying the induction of small lesions in the hand motor representation in the, in the primary motor cortex. And he had a squirrel monkey model and these little monkeys, um, he constrained the use of their stroke affected hands. And so they had to actually feed themselves using their, their stroke hands. So they had to pick up these little tiny banana flavored pellets to eat with their stroke affected hands. So he, he forced use is what it was called. And he showed that by kind of constraining the non-stroke hand, forcing these high volumes of use in the affected arm, that you saw this massive reorganization of um, the function of the res remaining neurons, the neurons that were not damaged by the stroke. And that was really the first demonstration of neuroplasticity on a, on a functional scale. And it's and the, really the first kind of mechanistic demonstration of the fact that rehabilitation does something to the brain and that you can actually shape it to do something positive. So that was actually mind blowing as a doctoral student. I mean, I can't tell you how exciting it was. Um, and so from there on, we've really been pursuing this idea of how do we stimulate plasticity like that? What are the boundaries of it? How much can we stimulate? Um, how much, you know, when does it fail? Can we regrow new neurons? I'm still not sure about the answer to that question. I think it's probably no, not on a scale necessary, for example, to totally repair a brain from stroke. But are, are, are new neurons being grown sometimes in the brain? I, I, uh, I'm not so sure. In the human brain, it's really hard to know because we can't quite count them. But in other model systems, there are suggestions that that might be possible. So it's it's been really exciting field to be in. And I feel really lucky that I kind of, I hit it right at that moment where it was just exploding with possibility. So the other thing I could comment on that happened right about that same time, so this was in the mid to late 90s, is all of a sudden we had access to technology like and magnetic resonance imaging. So before then you could do an MRI, but you really were just looking at a structural MRI. And all of a sudden, in the late you know, 90s, early 2000s, imaging centers and research facilities became more available, not super available, but they started to emerge. And so we now have this opportunity to look inside a brain while it's changing, map it before and after an intervention, and start to look at things like brain chemistry, brain function, and now more recently, brain structure. Um, and as each of those technologies comes online, we, we learn a lot more about the capacity of the brain to change. That's so cool. I love when the confluence of thought and technology um, happens because um, sometimes we have these ideas, but we have no technology to look into it. And here, the the ideas sort of co-evolved with the technology. I guess also with the technology prompting more questions on you know what to look at and and all of that. Tell me about your work that you've done in. in two areas I think would be really interesting to explore. One is sort of the rehabilitation aspect that we've already touched upon. And then the other one would be like, what can you and I who haven't had a stroke uh, do to protect our brain or even make it work a little bit better? Is there, can we push the boundaries of neuroplasticity without injury? I think that the definitive answer there is yes, certainly. Um, there's a lot of demonstrations of, of different um, things that will shape the brain. So the, the most important kind of takeaway, if you're like in a super hurry, you want to turn the podcast after this comment, I guess you can. The, the most important piece of all of this story is that the single largest driver of change in your brain is your behavior. So I always think of this as amazingly optimistic and, and um, powerful because your brain is being shaped by the choices you're making every day. So you, you get to be in charge. It's yours. Um, so, at, you know, things that will positively shape the brain is, you know, engagement and, and challenge. And that can come both in the form of academic challenge or kind of cognitive challenge, but also in the form of motor challenge. So our, our work and others has shown that when the brain, the brain will show its most change, be its most neuroplastic, when you're trying to do something that's just slightly beyond your capacity. So it can't be too easy because you already have enough brain structure and function to accomplish it. And if it's too hard, you're not succeeding enough to make that change. So we call this the Goldilocks kind of experiment in my lab. And it's actually um, 
now been formalized in something called the challenge point hypothesis. So you always want to be pushing so that you're doing something that's difficult, but achievable, you know? And so in, in like the experiments we run, we, we're actually hoping to make them hard enough that people fail three or four times out of 10. That's okay. Because failure is actually incredibly instructive and it means they're continuing to push and be very challenged by the particular task. So that, that's an example of behavior. And by the contrary, we don't, you know, we didn't all get up this morning and take a neuroplasticity vitamin or pill, right? And there's a reason for that. It's because there is no particular drug um, that we can take that will make our brain or change our brain as much as we can in just the choices we make in our daily life. So along those lines, the, you know, the other really positive drivers are sleep. Um, and I'm not a sleep researcher, so I have to tread carefully here, but they're wonderful work in this area. But we understand very clearly that when we're learning something and we're changing our brain, in order for that change to become a more permanent change, a lasting change, um, it requires sleep. For whatever reason, whatever magic is happening, it only happens while we're at sleep. And different types of learning are probably associated with some of the different phases of sleep. There's probably other important things happening during the sleep process too. It's not just about memory and brain health, um, uh, but that's a key element of what's happening at that time. And so that would be kind of your, your second kind of thing you can do. And you have these kind of associated effects um, that sleep have upon whole body systems. So we know that it would, for example, getting enough sleep, and that would be seven or eight hours a night for an adult, um, you'll see things like less inflammation through the whole body, including neuroinflammation. You see reductions in the stress hormone cortisol. And we know that when cortisol, the stress hormone cortisol is high, that that can often block some of the neurotrophic factors that enable neuroplasticity, so they compete. And so what you want to do is be able to keep that hormone, that stress hormone at a, at a low level. You don't want it to be persistently high because it's blocking your capacity for learning, which means you're blocking your capacity for brain plasticity. Um, and then kind of the last thing that is, seems to be very key for brain health is some kind of physical exercise. Um, there's a lot of debate and a lot we don't understand about the dose, the intensity, there's lots of questions there about the, the prescription of exercise. But there is a kind of this uniform finding that exercise is um, neuroprotective. So it helps keep your brain healthy. If you do have something like a stroke or a concussion, head injury, um, it helps speed recovery after those, after your brain is hurt. It facilitates learning. So it seems to put our brain into a space where it's more able to become neuroplastic and change to accommodate learning. Um, and then you get a ton of associated kind of neurovascular health effects that come with that. So we see more blood flow and more blood flow means more, you know, dendrites can uh, grow and be remodeled. And that translates very directly into faster learning. And it seems to be particularly important for uh, cognitive or what we call explicit memories. So memories that are made that are things we can say out loud. Um, but the other part that exercise seems to be very helpful with that is a paper actually we have under review right now showing that um, in more kind of complex visual motor skills. So movements that are directed by a target or have some kind of rule you're following that those are also highly benefited by um, including exercise with a practice session. So there's a lot in there to unpack, but those, that's kind of my recipe um, for kind of brain health um, and longevity. It sounds like such good advice, right? Like um, <laughs> sleep well, keep your stress levels low, exercise regularly, push yourself just outside of your comfort zone, and then the best is this empowering message of your behavior is going to form your brain mm -hmm. and, and influence your brain. And that's so different from the way I teach. I teach the brain creates your behaviors. And wow. now you're telling me that those behaviors in turn are going to go and shape the brain. Um, that's that's really cool. And it it does give a lot of agency to the individual to kind of be in charge of it. Because uh, we often, I think, sometimes feel like, well, I'm um, 
kind of just subjected to whatever my brain is doing, but we're not, right? I don't think so. I mean, it's certainly your brain is going to affect, you know, what you're interested in, how you learn. Those These things are, you know, it's a two-way street or kind of virtuous cycle, if you will. But I think that it's really important to remember that we have a lot of capacity to change our brain by the decisions that we make, by the choices that we, um, or the, the ways we choose to spend our time and our energy, what we're thinking about, what we're working on. And then all those associated behaviors with it. Did I decide to exercise today? Or, um, you know, did I, did I decide to binge watch The Crown last night instead of going to bed at a decent time? That's maybe could be personal experience. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things that, that may shape, you know, our, our overall brain health, but um, we get to shape them. We do have that power. And the other kind of important thing too there is that, um, you know, we're all gonna do things, stay up too late, whatever, choose just not to exercise today. Um, and we can, they, they can be undone. You can come back at them, right? With this idea that you have this capacity to change over time and change with your behavior. So I think that's a, a really neat and important thing as well. There are I really things. love that because it, 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 it keeps it wide open, right? Like it takes us away from that predetermined pathway um, that we have agency to change this um, ongoing. And even if we've made a series of bad decisions, we can catch up on good decisions, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And we all go through phases in life where things don't work as smoothly as you'd hope, right? I mean, I, I started thinking a lot about cortisol over the pandemic. And I felt like, you know, the whole world was living in this huge, you know, ongoing level of stress and uncertainty. And, and um, I started thinking a lot, for example, about how that was affecting the ability of you know, our, our students, our graduate students and our undergraduate students to, to learn, or even my own children, to try to continue to be successful students and in that environment where you just have this tremendous stress level and, and started really trying to think through, okay, what are the things we need to acutely manage so that we can try to bring this down while acknowledging there's a lot of uncertainty in the world so that we can kind of try to bring that a bit back into balance, a bit more back into balance. So the danger is you get used to that high level of stress and you just live there. And we've all done that for periods of our life as well. And that's actually very detrimental to brain health and many other health systems in the body too. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm wondering like about the effect on memory for these high cortisol levels, because when I think back to the pandemic, there are some key moments, key Zoom meetings that I remember quite vividly. But that entire stretch of time is a little bit foggy. Yeah. And that's because you weren't encoding memories as well as you would if you weren't so stressed. And so that's exactly one of the side effects of that high level of stress. Poor sleep. We weren't sure if we could go out. I don't know if everyone was you know, doing all the things they would normally do exercise-wise. We also weren't having our social interactions, which is a whole other piece of brain wellness. Um, that we understand from looking at people who live to be very old. And they, those are often people with very rich social connections. We starting to understand that. I don't think mechanistically we understand why that would work, but there's some really good emerging evidence that that's an important piece here too. But yeah, certainly I don't think any of us made very good memories over that time. And I think, um, I think on the backside of that, we all have to kind of be patient with ourselves and with our students and with our kids as we're, you know, we're only a few years out from that now. We're still making up that lost ground, quite honestly, um, in our learning and, and in our development. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with that. I see it in my kids as well. I see it in myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was a, almost like a pause button on, on development and, and cognition and memory formation, at least for me, um, right. in that period. Definitely. Well, thing, no, I was going to say, and you and I both have teenagers, right? So we both know that that, yeah. that's a, that was a huge pause when you were 15, 16 yeah. to hit the pause button for two years. Absolutely. Um, especially like the social connections and things like that. That was huge. Um, another thing that you alluded to was sort of the connection between brain and body. Um, tell me a little bit more about that, because that goes back to that ancient dichotomy, you know, like, mind and body are separate, mind over matter, um, and, and all of that. It goes back to the ancient Greeks who were trying to wrap their head around it. And your work is showing that division is not really a thing. Is that fair to say? 
I, yeah, I, I don't think you can, you know, we can't take the head out off the body and have, you know, it function on its own, right? It doesn't work. Um, and so certainly the two are, are richly and highly interconnected. And I, I do believe that to some degree that, you know, the mind over body kind of thing, you, you can kind of do that, but your, your body is also going to have these profound influences on you, on your brain as well. So uh, there are these kind of critical relationships. So one that we're really interested in right now that um, is work we're just beginning. Um, but we're actually right now looking at how people with chronic pain, we're actually looking at people with knee osteoarthritis, um, how that is remodeling their uh, sensory processing systems and their motor systems and the integrative systems, such as the cerebellum that mediate between those two in the brain. And this is really interesting work because um, people with knee osteoarthritis, um, many of them are very painful. Many of them with, with radiographic evidence of very bad knee joint integrity are not painful at all. And so it's really unusual. It's really interesting to so think, well, why would this person be painful and, and this person not? Um, and then similarly, that we see a, a sex, a biological sex effect here as well, where more people with painful knee osteoarthritis tend to be women. So it suggests somehow pain is being um, processed and interpreted differently um, in the brain. It suggests it's not just a purely mechanical um, type of peripheral thing. So it's one of these examples of this body brain axis. And then we see it most profoundly in our work on exercise and the effects of exercise on brain. And the way my lab studies this is kind of unique. We're not having people train for marathons or even train day after day after day. We are looking at the effect of very short bouts of high intensity exercise on uh, neural excitability, cortical excitability, and capacity for learning. And what we've discovered is when you do these very short, intense bouts of exercise, and when I, when I say short and intense, we're doing three three-minute sessions of exercise. So it's nine minutes of exercise. So you would think, oh, anyone can do nine minutes of exercise. That's nothing. But they're doing it at between 75 and 90% of their maximal capacity. So it's nine minutes or three times three minutes of incredibly intense exercise. And we do this on a bicycle, but we've done a bunch of uh, neurophysiologic experiments um, adjacent to the exercise. And we find a whole host of changes in the brain that immediately follow this exercise. So we find that the motor cortex is much more excitable. We find that um, the cerebellum is putting less inhibition onto motor cortex, which may be one of the reasons why it's more excitable. So cerebellar in, cerebellum is usually inhibiting motor cortex and that's vastly reduced after exercise. We find that when we do recruitment curves, we have a sharper rise. So what we do to, uh, to do these experiments is we're using brain stimulation, non-invasive brain stimulation. We're slowly turning up the intensity of the stimulation over the motor area and we get these recruitment curve slopes and that indicates how quickly a pool of neurons can be recruited. So we've seen this very sharp rise in the slope of the recruitment curves. We can bring in more neurons uh, very rapidly. And then lastly, and normally the two uh, motor cortices mutually inhibit one another. So if, if you're listening to this and you wave around your right hand, your left hand can hold still, right? And that's because when you move your right hand, your left motor cortex is actually inhibiting your right motor cortex. And that allows independent hand function, independent arm function. And so that uh, mutual inhibition is actually further enhanced by this exercise bounce. What you have is kind of, if you think about, you have this motor cortical system and after exercise, it's almost like you've turned up the dial on it. So you've just amplified it at all these different levels. And so we think the net result of that is you have a system that's ready to change. It's super excited, it's ready for information, charged up and prepared to show learning or to be have a greater capacity for learning. Now, we do the experiment, we do the learning experiment in healthy controls, um, things get super interesting because if you, if you have someone exercise and then you, you have them perform a task, you would think that they would be much better at that task than if they hadn't exercised before it. And it turns out that in the short term, in a single session, that's not true. So we see actually no effect in a single session. But if we have that person come back the next day, 24 hours later, 
and we have them perform that same task that they performed adjacent to exercise the day before, we see this very significant improvement in their skill level. And so what they've done is they've gone home and they've, they've learned overnight. It's called offline learning and it's attributable to the consolidation of a motor memory. So the memory that they were was short-term and kind of fragile that they made from practice became long-term and stable overnight. And so the effect of exercise is more long-term over the course of learning rather than just very acute to the event itself. So it's pretty so cool. If this has implications for our students. We can tell them exactly how to learn and how to study for an exam. So yeah. like read the chapter, think yeah. about it, go for a run, sleep, then you'll be better. So that yeah. whole thing of putting the book under my pillow, that was never going to work. I needed to go for a run instead, right? And that would help me. Run shoes instead. That's true. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the book under the pillow, it maybe just felt nice to have it close, but it probably didn't help you learn anything. But it is kind of that combination. And so we have not done the experiment. I want to acknowledge we could redo this experiment where people in the morning do the exercise and the practice and then come back at night. So we don't have sleep. We just have time in between. Um, and that would be really neat. That's something on my to do list because I'm not sure if it's time or sleep, but I'm pretty suspicious that sleep doesn't hurt. <laughs> Well, based on what you were saying earlier from the work other people have been doing, it looks like sleep is really important for, for the consolidation of those memories. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. I've gotten really good life advice here already um, <laughs> to protect my brain here. Um, we've talked a lot about the brain and about its effects on the body and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me to that question that we always like to ask people, which is, what's your favorite body part? Uh, my favorite body part. So it changes. But since a grad student, I honestly have been obsessed with the cerebellum. So I'm going with cerebellum. Um, I just feel like it is the most important slash least understood of our central nervous system when we look at it. It's so beautiful. It's so regular. It just has a few different cells. There's nothing, you know, but it, every time someone does a really detailed study of it, we learn that it's doing more than we thought it was before, uh, is more and more important for function and many functions, cognitive, motor, balance, emotion. Yeah. So that's everything. It's I'm team cerebellum. cerebellum. Yeah, no, I'm team cerebellum right there with you. It's, um, it is one of my favorite areas of the brain. Um, yeah. for exactly all of those reasons. It's like an unsung hero, right? Like relegated to the posterior cranial fossa. I would call it the little brain, underestimated, and yet it's the powerhouse right it, there. It's so true. And, and it was so ironic about that is, um, you know, early MRI studies, it was, it, they didn't have a big enough field of view to get the whole head in. So they all just cut the cerebellum off. We just know about that. <laughs> The cortex up above. And so um, a, a large missed opportunity that hopefully is being rectified these days. Yeah, I'm sure it is, especially with this growing body of work around the cerebellum. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So what's your least favorite body part? I know my least, that was, that's much harder. I have great appreciation for, for the whole thing. I've got to tell you, I think that it's, um, it's pretty amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm going to have to hang with a, a, a brain system. I think when I stick with least favorite, Oh, it's all so cool. I don't think I can do it, Claudia. I don't know. Well, what's just kind of annoying, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I kind of like them, but it's still annoying. Yeah. So, so I will tell you what's annoying to me, but it's very inside baseball. So forgive me if you don't agree with me or, or people get mad. So in my field of study that uh, people are very interested in recovery of motor function after stroke, after damage, and people are obsessed with the corticospinal tract. And it is the most boring thing in the history of the world. It's like being obsessed with, you know, the freeway. It's just a track and it doesn't make connections. It's not branching anywhere. It starts in the motor cortex. It ends at the spinal cord. And yeah, super bummer if it gets hurt. Like that's bad. It's really bad. But there are a lot of other neat things that can help to, to take over that function. And there are a lot of other brain systems that are very important for elegant motor function. So I think we get a little hung up on the corticospinal tract. And there's a lot made of this idea that if we understand its integrity, we can 
predict everything after a stroke. And I think that's very um, short-sighted and simplistic, quite frankly. I agree. I mean, it does cross the midline, so it does do one interesting it's thing. There's a that. That's kind of neat. Decussation. Yeah. That's cool. kind of nice, but yeah. you're right. It's just one ax track, like one bundle of axons doing nothing but going from A to B. Yeah, no, I always talk about it in the in the sense that here it is, and when it fires, things happen, but you want to be sure it's got a good advisory system. So let's talk about everything. <laughs> That's that exactly right. It. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not thinking anyone should hurt their corticospinal tract. Like, I mean, I treasure mine. I, I really do, but I think that it's um, it's much ado about you know, it's like, okay, cool. Now let's move on to all the other neat stuff out there. So. Yeah, it's very true. I think people go for like the thing that they see doing the thing, but it's like, well, somebody's yeah. going to tell that tract what to do. Right. Yeah. And when to do it. Exactly. Right? It pretty yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for joining us here on Body Banter. Um, that was really insightful. It's always lovely to talk with you and learn about what you're working on and your insights on neuroplasticity and i'm excited for the next decades of your work and research and what will come from that thank you so much oh thanks so much for asking me all right and that concludes another episode of body banter thanks for listening thank you for listening to another episode of body banter we are claudia and shagun and we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time 